Okay guys, here's our first segment on Unit 8, uh, dealing with the quantification of chemical reactions. Uh, it's kind of a fancy way of saying we're going to take everything we've learned in the past two units about compounds, naming compounds, chemical reactions, reaction types, predicting products, and now instead of saying what are we working with and what are we producing, we're going to talk about how much. So the questions are going to be like, if you start with this many grams of sodium and this many grams of chlorine, how much sodium chloride will you make? Because it's going to be assumed that you know what you're going to make. So now we're going to talk about how much we're going to make. To do that, we have two major concepts or two major chapters in this unit. Uh, the first is chapter 10, which talks about the mole uh, and what the mole is. No, sorry guys, it's not the furry little creature. Uh, it is a chemical quantity within the world of chemistry that we'll talk about. The second thing is something called stoichiometry. Uh, stoichiometry is again a fancy word for saying the mathematics behind chemistry. So those are our two big concepts for this unit. Uh, so we're going to get started. And to get started, we're actually going to jump out of the presentation. Okay, today we're going to talk about the mole. Now I know what you're thinking. I know what a mole is. It's a small furry creature that digs holes in the ground and destroys gardens. And some of you might be thinking that it's a growth on your ant's face with hair sticking out of it. Well, in this case, a mole is a concept that we use in chemistry to count molecules, atoms, and just about anything extremely small. Have you ever wondered how many atoms there are in the universe or in your body or even in a grain of sand? Scientists have wanted to answer that question, but how do you count something as small as an atom? Well, in 1811, someone had an idea that if you have equal volumes of gases at the same temperature and pressure, they would contain an equal number of particles. His name was Lorenzo Romano Amadeo Carlo Avogadro. I wonder how long it took him to sign autographs. Unfortunately for Avogadro, most scientists didn't accept the idea of the atom and there was no way to prove he was right. There was no clear difference between atoms and molecules. Most scientists looked at Avogadro's work as purely hypothetical and didn't give it much thought. But it turned out he was right. By late 1860, Avogadro was proven correct and his work helped lay the foundation for the atomic theory. Unfortunately, Avogadro died in 1856. Now the thing is that the amount of particles in even small samples is tremendous. For example, if you have a balloon of any gas at 0 degrees Celsius and at a pressure of 1 atmosphere, then you have precisely 602 sectillion gas particles. That is, you have 6 with 23 zeros after it particles of gas in a container or in scientific notation, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. This example is a little misleading because gases take up a lot of space due to the high kinetic energy of the gas particles, and it leaves you thinking atoms are bigger than they really are. Instead, think of water molecules. If you pour 18.01 grams of water into a glass, which is 18.01 milliliters, which is like 3.5 teaspoons of water, you'll have 602 sectillion molecules of water. Since Lorenzo Romano, uh, never mind, Avogadro was the first one to come up with this idea, scientists named the number 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd after him. It is simply known as Avogadro's number. Now, back to the mole. Not that mole. This mole. Yep, this number has a second name, the mole. Chemists use the term mole to refer to the quantities that are at the magnitude of 602 sectillion. This is known as a molar quantity. Atoms and molecules are so small that chemists have bundled them into groups called moles. Moles are hard for students to understand because they have a hard time picturing the size of a mole, or a 602 sectillion. It's just too big to wrap our brains around. Remember our 18.01 milliliters of water? Well, that's a mole of water. But how much is that? Exactly what does 602 sectillion look like? Maybe this will help. Exchange the water particles for donuts. If you had a mole of donuts, they would cover the entire Earth to a depth of 8 kilometers, which is about 5 miles. You'd really need a lot of coffee for that. If you had a mole of basketballs, you could create a new planet the size of the Earth. If you received a mole of pennies on the day you were born and spent a million dollars a second until the day you died at the age of 100, you would still have more than 99.99% of your money in the bank. Okay, now we sort of have an idea how large the mole is. So how do we use it? You might be surprised to know that chemists use it the same way you use pounds to buy grapes, deli meat, or eggs. When you go to the grocery store, you don't go to the deli counter and ask for 43 slices of salami. You buy your salami by the pound. When you buy your eggs, you buy a dozen eggs. 
When we hear the word dozen, we probably think of the number 12. We also know that a pear is 2, a baker's dozen is 13, a gross is 144, and a ream of paper is... anybody? A ream is 500. Well, a mole is really the same thing. For a chemist, a mole conjures up the number 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Not a fuzzy little animal. The only difference is that the other quantities are more familiar to us. So there you have it. The story of the mole. Avogadro, basketballs, and how to buy salami at the grocery store. Okay, so that's kind of your basic background on the mole. We're going to move back now into the presentation and kind of add a little bit to that little video. So when we're working with the mole, first thing you need to realize is that chemists can't individually count atoms. They're just too small. We can't go down and say one atom, two atoms, three atoms. They're just incredibly, so incredibly small that we can barely even see them through computer-aided telescopes or microscopes and those kind of things. So we really need to deal with atoms in packets. And those packets that we work with are moles. It's very much like buying bottle rockets. If you're going to buy a little, some bottle rockets for a little 4th of July celebration, you don't buy one bottle rocket at a time. You go to the store and you buy 144 bottle rockets or you buy a gross of bottle rockets. A gross is basically 12 sets of 12. So the mole works in the same way, but just for chemists. Now, um, the mole is also like a dozen. And I use that example because I think that's one that most people are really comfortable with. If I say the word dozen, most people in our room are going to instantly think of the number 12. If you say the word mole to me, I instantly think of 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd because I just know that that's how many particles are going to be in a mole's worth of stuff. Okay. Now, the cool thing is it also relates to mass by comparing its atomic mass. Okay. So let's talk, talk about carbon-12. So carbon-12 has a mass of 12 in it. So if we take 12 grams of carbon-12, Okay, so kind of follow me here. 12 grams of carbon-12, and let's convert this and see if we can figure out how many atoms are going to be in that carbon-12 sample. So if I use exactly 12 grams of carbon-12, there's 1,000 grams in a kilogram. We know that there's 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms in a 1 AMU. And if you remember, AMUs are atomic mass units, which is basically a way to measure the mass of individual atoms. So we know the mass, we're now in mass of atoms, but we also remember that every proton and neutron in an atom is its is one AMU. So there's 12 AMUs in carbon-12 for every one atom in carbon-12, because you have six protons and six neutrons to get 12 AMUs. So if you take this number, divided by that, divided by that, divided by that, we get 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. So for every 12 grams of carbon-12, we get this many atoms. Now here's the cool thing. If we use oxygen 16 instead of carbon 12, only two numbers in this formula change. This 12 becomes a 16, and we get 16 grams of oxygen. This number we change then to a 16 also. So if the 12 and 12 change to 16 and 16, this number here never changes. So you can take a look at any element on the periodic table, and its mass will also tell you how many atoms it has per mole. So again, we're going to jump out of the presentation if we can here. And if we jump back to our periodic table, if you recall, the atomic mass of an element is an average of those isotopes. So we were talking about carbon-12 and oxygen-16, the individual isotopes. But if you take their average, for example, iron's average is 55.845. This number here is the atomic mass. So if I want to know how many atoms I can fit into a certain amount of iron, here's where I start. Every 55.845 grams of iron gives me one mole's worth of iron, which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So we have that relationship between all three things. On the same token, if I go over to, let's say, sulfur, if I want to have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of sulfur, I need to measure out 32.06 grams of sulfur because they're equal to each other. Okay? Very much like a dozen eggs won't weigh the same as a dozen apples or a dozen elephants or a dozen cars, you're not going to have the same mass for a mole's worth of anything. But the periodic table and these atomic masses give us that information. Okay, So let's go back to our keynote now. And if we take a look, 
Um, we get our little line down here, which is going to be kind of useful. I would probably highlight this one here. One mole equals this many particles, and one mole equals the atomic mass of any substance in grams. Those are two relationships you're going to use a lot in the math in this unit. Moving on to the next slide, if we start talking about particles, um, that determines a very vague general term. So what I want to do is make sure that we use the right terms in the right scenarios. So instead of just saying particles for everything, we're actually going to call things by their correct particle. Okay? You wouldn't want everybody to say, hey, how you doing, person? How you doing, person? How you doing, person? Because we're not just people. We're not just a person. I have a name. You have a name. Same thing for different atoms and elements and compounds. If you're a single element, you're not just a particle. You're an atom. If you're a charged group um, of elements or a group, you're an ion. If you're covalently bonded things together, you're a molecule. And if you're an ionic compound, we call you a formula unit. Okay? So if we move up to the board... Here's four examples of that idea. So if you're working with individual atoms by themselves, neutral, we're going to call them atoms. If you're working with charged particles, it's like sulfur to the negative 2 charge, or you can use nitrate, NO3, or carbonate, or any of those charged polyatomic ions, we give them the term ion. If you have an ionic compound that you're working with, for example, sodium sulfide, those are formula units. Now this is really just like saying the formula for this compound, but we use the term formula unit here. And then finally, if you have a covalently bonded substance like sulfur dioxide, all nonmetals, we use the term molecule with that. Okay. Now we've used these terms before, but in this unit when we start labeling our answers, I want you to properly label with the right type of particle as we work through it. Now, to put this all together, we need to talk about molar mass, or basically how heavy is any compound. Because we can get the atomic mass of sulfur and the atomic mass of sulfur or sulfide ions, but how do I do the mass of compounds put together? Okay. Now if you think about it, if the atomic mass is sulfur and I have sulfur in here, the overall mass of sodium plus sulfur should be just adding them all together, and that's what we really do. So if I want to know the mass of the compound sodium sulfide, I need to take one sulfur plus two sodiums, because there's a two here that says I have two sodiums in my compound. Okay. Now when we relate that, we call these atomic masses in compounds molar masses. And we do that because we're dealing with different types of particles, so we give it one generic term, molar mass, across all of those. Okay. Now when we calculate molar mass, really all we got to do is add things up. So let's do these together. It's kind of a practice thing, and then we'll do some more in class. So let's do the molar mass of sodium carbonate. Okay? I want to know how many grams are in a mole's worth of sodium carbonate. So basically, how many grams are in one mole of sodium carbonate? Now, sodium carbonate, we must be careful with this. We want to make sure our charge is balanced. So carbonate's a 2 minus. Sodium's a 1 plus, so I need to have two sodiums here to balance this out. So when I do my math, I better have two sodiums in here, okay? So how many grams are in one mole of sodium carbonate? Or basically, we're asking, what is the molar mass of sodium carbonate? So let's work it out. We have sodiums, carbon, and oxygens. So I have sodium, I have carbon, and oxygen. First thing, how many sodiums do I have? Well, I have two of them. How many carbons do I have? I have one. How many oxygens do I have? I have three. I have two sodiums times its atomic mass. So now what we have to do is we have to go back to our periodic table and look up sodium. And if we look, sodium has this mass of 22.989769288. Grams per mole. That's a gigantic number rounded way out. Okay, for our purposes here, when we work with our atomic masses, we want to make sure that we round off all our numbers at least to the hundreds place. Okay, so I'm not going to ask you to always pull all those digits out because some of these are rounded out a really long ways and we know them very far out, like sodium. But if they are one like this, go ahead and round that out to just be to the hundreds place. So we'll say 22.99. So we have 22. 0.99 grams per mole. 
carbon we take a look and carbon is 12.011 so again I'm just going to round everything to the hundreds place in this process to simplify it okay there's nothing wrong with going all the way out your numbers will just be slightly different as you do the math for simplicity's sakes and just validity and being able to collaborate with each other if we all round to the hundreds place here off our periodic table it's going to be worth it for us to do it all together so we'll do it that way uh, so carbon 12.01 again grams per mole and then oxygen if you take a look it's 15.999 where essentially oxygen ends up being 16.00 grams per mole so what's the total here well, just add them up okay so 2 times 22.99 plus 12.01 plus 3 times 16 Point zero zero, okay. So what do we get here? We get a uh, forty-five point nine eight, twelve point oh one, and forty-eight point zero zero. These are all grams per mole, grams per mole, grams per mole. And we add all these together. We get a nine. A 9, that's 10 plus 5, 15, that can carry 1, 4 plus 4 is 8, 9, 10. So 105.99 grams per mole. Well, that tells us for every 1 mole of sodium carbonate, I get 105.99 grams. Or it's 105.99 grams per mole. Okay molar mass. Let's go back to our PowerPoint and see if I did my math right. And sure enough, there it is. 105.99 grams per mole. Okay. That molar mass, we'll use that in additional calculations as we go, as we go through this unit. Okay, guys, that's the end for our units. There are two more on the screen, lead to nitrate and bromine. Go ahead and do those as practice, and we'll start uh, the day with some more practice. Thank you.